Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Storytellers Project Live in Your House. I'm Kayla White. I'm a journalist with the Arizona Republic and azcentral.com, where I have been involved with the Arizona Storytellers Project for years. So I am so excited to be your host for tonight's show. Thank you so much for tuning in, for taking a risk with part of your evening and spending it on live storytelling. I so appreciate it because hearing from others is how we connect with our communities. Since 2016, the Arizona Storytellers Project has produced more than 100 live storytelling events across the country. But as part of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic, they have postponed those shows through September as we all stay home and stay safe. As part of the USA Today Network's response to the pandemic, the, U the Storytellers Project has started producing these live stream shows. This is actually the fifth one. They have handpicked tellers from more than 1,000 across the country. Tonight, you're gonna to hear from five of those tellers who will be telling from inside their homes. Their stories will be entertaining, illuminating, uplifting, some a little bit heartbreaking, but I can promise all will be entertaining. Actually, let's bring up those tellers to welcome them to the show. I'd like to welcome Julia King Cohn. Perfect. Hi, uh, David Chicatello, Eric Sedeno, Barry and Constance Karcher, and Megan Finnerty. Hi. 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 Woo, the crowd is wooing. <laughs> All right, so what to expect for tonight's show? I don't know about you, I love TED Talks. Tonight is not a TED Talk, so just get that out right away. It's not an educational lecture or a motivational speech or a sales pitch. Instead, tonight is live storytelling. And one thing I love about engaging with live storytelling is it's actually a lot like visiting a friend. By that, I mean, you know, you sit down, you listen actively with an open heart and an open mind to someone you're trying to get to know better. So we hope we do that tonight because, you know, some of our tellers will be more casual and conversational. Some may be more polished and professional. Some may have humor. Some may reflect on more serious truths. But we ask that you receive all of their stories with an open heart and an open mind, despite the distance we have from each other and any technical difficulties if we have them. Hopefully not. All right, so about the theme for tonight, it is outdoor adventures. For some of us, the outdoors means just that adventure, fun, exploration. For others, it means danger or risk. For some people, being outside brings peace, and for some, it might bring strife. Being outside in nature can be isolating and challenging, and it can call on us to find perseverance and a sense of purpose. The stories you'll hear tonight will reflect that entire span. So with that, I'd like to bring up our first teller for the night, Julia King Cohn, who has a story about a lifelong passion taking her on a wild adventure. Please welcome Julia. And the crowd goes wild. <laughs> My story feels so far detached from the desert where I live and the pandemic caused quarantine that we're living through right now. That sometimes I almost wonder if it ever even happened. But the truth is, you never forget your first love, your first time. In my case, the first love was dogs. For as long as I can remember, I have loved dogs, but not in that kind of obsessive American way where you dress your dog up for Halloween and push it in the stroller when you go for a walk and maybe sit for family portraits with your dogs. No, I wanted to be the dog growing up. I wanted to be the dog so much that my mom would frequently find me behind the couch of our living room with all of my stuffed dogs shoved up my shirt, pretending to birth and raise my puppies. <laughs> to my mom's relief, I grew out of that. <laughs> but that dream of being the dog mother was then replaced. I wanted to be a dog encyclopedia author. I spent hours and hours transcribing my dog fact books into a journal of my own that I felt was my original work that I would someday publish and share my vast knowledge of everything canine with the world. And then um, I learned about plagiarism and I was crushed. <laughs> but it was in one of those dog fact books that I first saw the word I did around. So it was a thousand mile sled dog race across Alaska. I remember walking with my third grade class to the library, trying to remember how it was spelled. I-D-I-T-A-R-O-D, I-D-I-T-A-R-O-D. Trying to remember so that I could look up every single book and learn everything about what sounded like the most magical experience in the world. I did just that. And from then on, I was hooked. 
Now the childhood dream of becoming a dog mother was replaced with wanting to be a dog musher. And somehow, despite being a native Arizonan and a total cactus hugger to the core, that dream never wore off. I searched the internet for ways to follow this ridiculous idea and found when I was 19 years old, what was basically a Craigslist for mushers. You could buy harnesses and sleds and booties for your dog's feet. But what I was interested in was the help wanted section. Competitive mushers have anywhere between 15 or 115 dogs, and all of those dogs have to poop and get fed several times a day, and of course, they have to run. So mushers are always looking for help. I literally picked the first guy on the page. He was a musher named Stan, who was 72 years old and lived 35 miles from the nearest village with 36 sled dogs in northern Quebec by himself. Nothing scary about that at all. I sent Stan an email to say I was wildly, crazily interested in scooping his dog's poop. And he said, great, come on up. <laughs> the terms of the arrangement were really simple. I wouldn't get paid, but I would get a room in his small cabin and he would teach me everything he knew about dog mushing. So we planned for my arrival in right at the beginning of fall, so the September of that year, just in time to get started with fall training for the dogs. I actually managed to convince the organization that was funding my college education that this was a study abroad opportunity because I was a French major after all, and I was going to Quebec. So I packed my bags and clawed my way through Canadian customs where they were fairly certain that I was either being trafficked or that I was a runaway. I managed to convince them that I was going to live with Stan of my own volition, and I made it. I didn't tell them that my mother was absolutely terrified and that my friends were certain that I was going to either die from the elements or be murdered by Stan and fed to his dogs. Stan picked me up from the airport in Montreal in his dog rig, which is this awesome truck that's been outfitted to fit up to 30 dogs if you need to, which as a musher you do. And we drove further from humanity and higher up the mountain and deeper into the forest. And I just remember thinking to myself, if you're gonna shit your pants for fear, this is the time. And we parked in the dog yard in the front of Stan's cabin and I got out of the truck and it was dark already, but I was assaulted by the sound of 35 barking sled dogs and the smell of mountain air that felt very, very far from my dusty Phoenix smog. It was still fall, but the air was really very cold to my Arizona blood. And it seemed to whisper to me, sister, you ain't seen nothing yet. We're just getting started. I went to bed that night in what was essentially a closet of Stan's cabin, where I would be staying for the duration of my six month internship. And it was really impossible to distinguish whether the butterflies in my stomach were from excitement or from the fear of getting murdered and fed to the dogs. But spoiler alert, I wasn't murdered. Stan introduced me to my charges the next morning, and I set into a regular routine of feed, water, scoop the poop, train the dogs, repeat. Before the snow showed up, we would hitch 16 dogs at a time to the front of Stan's ATV and run them through the forest. And once we did that with one group of dogs, we would unhook them all, put them back in their houses, hook up another 16 dogs, and do this again until everybody had gotten their exercise. Once the snow showed up, we switched to a snow machine. And then after that, a sled. It was just a constant loop of doing those chores. I spent more time consistently outside during those six months than I ever had in my life. So I learned very quickly to adapt to this magical thing that they call winter. As a desert kid, I had grown very accustomed to the feeling of never being able to take off enough clothes to feel comfortable. But in Quebec, I learned that you can never put on enough clothes to truly feel warm. It doesn't seem to matter how technical your gear is. And as an Arizonan, you can imagine just how much technical winter gear I had. That much. <laughs> the first time the temperature got down to negative 45, I thought I might die. You actually feel your body actively trying to survive when it is negative 45 degrees outside. 
Because as a musher, it's not like you can hide in your house and drink a hot toddy and enjoy a blanket by the fire. No, you have dogs to take care of. You have to feed them. You have to scoop the poop. You have to stuff straw into their houses. And did I mention scooping poop? Because you have to scoop a lot of poop. Do you have any idea how much poop 35 sled dogs make? It's a lot. And if you're going to talk about the poop, we got to talk about the pee because, sorry, this is graphic, but male dogs have an amazing way of shooting their pee directly into their house. And it's always so cold that this freezes almost immediately to form what I lovingly referred to as peacicles inside their homes. I spent a lot of time that winter chipping peacicles out with a putty knife of their houses so that they could have a clean place to sleep. But the freezing temperatures and the hundreds of buckets of dog poop and the peacicles were all worth it for the feeling of being behind a dog team as they did what they love to do more than anything else in the world, and that was to run. On the runners of a sled, my fingers would be cold and my nose would be cold and my toes would be freezing. But on the back of that sled, my true childhood dream was, to, was realized. Not only to be a musher, but to be a dog. Because standing on those runners, I was a member of their pack and we were kindred spirits and we all wanted the same things in life. And that was food to eat and a place to sleep and a job to do. When my six months with Stan were up, I headed back home to finish my last couple years at ASU with the plan of moving to Alaska the minute I graduated. Fate had it that the semester I was going to graduate, I found myself on a dating website, quite curiously, and I wound up picking my husband exactly like I picked my mushing mentor, just the first guy on the page. We were engaged within six, within three months, and I told my fiance that Alaska was still part of the deal. Two weeks before our wedding, I finally set foot in that sacred state in order to participate in the Iditarod, not as a competitor yet, but as a volunteer. I got to spend a week out on the trail, sleeping in an airplane hangar, but taking care of the dog. One week after our wedding, my husband and I moved to Alaska and spent the summer working for an adventure tour company. He gave bus tours, and of course, I worked in the dog yard, taking care of now not 35 dogs, but 273 Alaskan Huskies and giving car for the grandson of the man who started my beloved Iditarod as dog. But right now, I'm on the mom of two kids with a full-time job who's just finished grad school kind of adventure. And I love it, but there are days where it's freaking hard. And let me tell you, a global pandemic hasn't exactly made anything easier. And it's on those days where there have been one too many diaper blowouts and too many papers due and IEPs to write. And quarantine really just feels like it's dragging on for 400,000 days that I close my eyes and I go back to that forest up in Northern Quebec, 36 kilometers from the nearest village. I smell the mountain air and I feel the warmth of my favorite sled dog's fur between my fingers. And I hear all of us howling at the moon together as one pack. My adventure may be different now, but that, that one is never far from the front of my mind because you just never forget
Julia, thank you so much for that story. I was laughing very loudly, completely alone in my living room. So I appreciate your humor and your grace and for sharing such an enjoyable journey with us. All right, so before I bring up my next teller, I would like to take a minute to thank the national sponsor for the Storytellers Project. Uh, Humana sponsors the Storytellers Project shows nationally and now virtually because they know that sharing stories with each other creates better, healthier people and healthier communities. And it's more important now than ever to connect with our communities and with our health. As the COVID-19 pandemic changes and the situation evolves, Humana is committed to the health, safety, and well-being of the people and communities it serves. So you can visit Humana.com to learn more about what Humana is doing every day to connect you to better health in your community. All right, now I'd like to pivot to a very different kind of story. I'd like to bring up David Ciccatello, who has a story about finding perseverance during an incredibly challenging, challenging experience. So everyone, please welcome David. Hello to my listening audience this evening. My outdoor adventure takes place in a land called Robber's Roost in southeastern Utah, a place of high desert and mesa, of scrub brush and cedar trees, of wild horses and free range cattle, a place where there's no cell phone towers. The nearest towns are two hours away. And all around are these wonderful, magnificent red rock canyons to explore and to hike through time and time again. But the story actually begins when I was growing up in Pennsylvania. And when I entered the, in kindergarten in 1958, my brother Lewis was at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. He was 13 years older than I was. He was a freshman and I was just entering kindergarten. And as I was growing up, my brother wasn't around, but he was around. My teachers and my parents would often say to me, your brother, Lewis. And I learned that he made all A's throughout school. He was the valedictorian of his high school class in 1958. And according to our dear mother, he had read every book in our hometown library. Quite, quite a feat. And as I was growing up, I could have grown resentful and bitter and angry about this excellent brother. But instead, I channeled that energy to aspire to be excellent like he was. And when I graduated high school in 1971, I decided to attend the University of Kansas where my brother Lewis had recommended that I consider. And he at the time was teaching at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He was an art professor there. And this began our first sustained period of bonding. On the weekends, I would go to visit him in Kansas City. He took me to my first Grateful Dead concert. He introduced me to Asian food. He taught me to play squash. And on those precious weekends, I worked with him in his art studio, helping him build these magnificent plexiglass sculptures. And we grew close over these four or six years that I spent there at Kansas. And when my life took me away to begin my career, we were separated for about 20, 25 years and only met occasionally for short vacations or holidays or on sad occasions when we had to attend the funerals of our beloved parents. And it was in the early 2000 period that I joined my brother Lewis and our other brother Carl and began to make trips to Utah, to these canyons, to visit the rock art and the ancient ruins of the native peoples. 
And along about 2006, at the end of one of these hikes, my brother Lewis turned to me and said, you're going to have to learn to repel. And that was my next challenge, to join Lewis on trips to these canyons where we had to climb and climb down and get to these ruins and these rock, these rock art panels. And these times together were special, just the two of us. Lewis would plan the week. He would plan the meals. And he would drive us from Colorado to Utah to spend these times together, the two of us, building campfires, taking these hikes, and sharing moments in complete silence. In 2011, we had planned a trip over March spring break. And our first few hikes were to warm up for our third day when we were to enter No Man's Canyon and do a day hike. And it was Sunday, March 6th, 2011. And this hike was to last maybe four hours to get through the canyon, get down, eat our lunch, get back to the truck, and on to the next camp. At our last rappel in this slot canyon area, which was like a, like a small rectangular cave-like structure that had one exit, and this exit was 100 feet down, and we set up the rappel, and he went first. My brother Lewis always went first. And rarely did he ever let me go first. This slot canyon to the edge of the cliff was very narrow. Only one person could go down at a time. And I was about 20 feet back in the slot, watched him go down to the edge, go over the edge and start down. I could hear him call back to me that it went fast. And then in a few seconds, it seemed, he called back and said, the rope's short. And in that moment, I panicked and I was in fear because I knew what he was facing. And what seemed to be another nanosecond, he called back to me, no biggie. And when my brother Lewis said no biggie, I felt he had it under control. And in the next moment, it seemed, the rope slipped through the rappel ring down over the edge of the cliff and to the bottom, my brother fell. I heard no cry, I heard no hard landing, but I knew he had gone down with the rope. And in that moment, I screamed his name and over and over and over again. I tried first to get out of that slot canyon, to go back out the way we came in, but I could not. I was wearing hiking shoes and I could not grab the slick rock to get up out of the slot area and out to the top of the rim of that canyon. I could not go down because I did not have an extra rope. This was to be a day hike. And within about 30 or 40 minutes, I realized that I had to make a decision to get to Friday. I could not go down, I could not go out. I was in that slot area on an interior ledge, protected from the elements virtually, and I could see out through this narrow slot. The only thing I had with me that day were the clothes that I was wearing and my backpack that had a lunch a sandwich, some water, some iced tea, an orange, a power bar, some trail mix. And I decided to ration my food as long as it would last that week. The days were about in the 60s. The evenings and overnight dropped below freezing. I curled up on that ledge and clutched the interior cushion of my backpack a slender uh, panel of insulation to help keep me warm underneath my long sleeve shirt. 
There was nothing to burn in that slot, no tree limbs, no leaves, no dried grass. And during the night, I curled up, shivered sometimes, watched the stars go by. And during the day, each day, I watched the contrails, the birds, carved my name, and made slash marks each day to mark the time in that slot. As I kept thinking, get to Friday, get to Friday. Because on Thursday, our loved ones knew that we were to come out of Utah. And I had left a map with my significant other. And I knew when those calls were not made that our loved ones would act and that search and rescue could come as soon as Friday. Well, Friday came and I met it with much anticipation that I could be rescued that day. And that long day turned into a long evening and night and there was no rescue. And I was devastated until very late at night, I heard a helicopter come by that slot. And in the dark, that helicopter shone its light into that slot area. And I stood up, saw the helicopter, shouted that I was here, though I knew they couldn't hear me. But I was relieved and overjoyed that they were looking for us finally. The next day, Saturday, it now had been six days that I had been in that slot, six days since my brother had fallen. And about one o'clock, a helicopter came around again. I stood up in the slot. They saw me. They saw my brother at the bottom of the canyon. They dropped the rescue squad and they came into that slot. I got rescued out of there about one o'clock on Saturday taken to the hospital in Moab, Utah by helicopter, the same helicopter that had rescued Aaron, Walsh, Aaron Ralston a few years ago from that time. And in the emergency room, I asked the doctor if there had been a, there was a priest in the hospital. And he said, no, there wasn't. But later on, he and a friend took me to mass that day. Had taken me out of the hospital because I needed something that the doctor knew would help me begin my healing. And I spoke to that priest after mass and unburdened the first part of what I had to deal with in this next phase of survival. I was grief stricken and guilt ridden that I had survived and my brother had not. When I got back to Tennessee, the second part of my survival story, my adventure story, was nothing that happened in the wilderness, but it happened inside me. I saw my physician, I saw my grief therapist, I saw my pastor. This A team of healers helped me get through the next ledge that I was on and for a longer time than six days. My doctor ordered all the cheeseburgers I could eat to gain back 15 pounds that I'd lost in that slot. My grief therapist asked me to write letters to my brother to unburden my guilt and grief and anger and my pastor gave me a book to read, which helped me come to accept the things that we would not otherwise consent to. This adventure lasted, this part of my survival story lasted for months. And I got through it because I had a team of healers and loved ones and perfect strangers who reached out to me to help me get through these darkest days. And it's perfectly fitting now, some eight years, nine years now, after this outdoor adventure, 
that we find ourselves, we find this planet on a ledge, this pandemic. And whether it's a global issue that puts the planet on a ledge, or a single person who has to face a divorce or a bankruptcy or the loss of a child, we face our grief and our trauma not alone. We get through it with those who help us heal and grow and get through it and survive and thrive beyond to help and share these things for others. Thank you for listening to me tonight. David, thank you so much for sharing such a personal and powerful story and for introducing us all to your brother. My pleasure. I also know you said today is your 67th birthday. So thank you so much for spending it with us and for using it to pay tribute to him. Yes, and I, I appreciate that because each time I share this story, I honor my brother and it's especially fitting here today on my birthday. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely, thank you again. All right, before I bring up our third teller for the night, I want to thank another sponsor of this show, Cox. As a digital connections company, Cox knows that the connections that are the most important are the ones that we share with each other. That is why they are sponsoring this tonight because they know sharing stories like this can inspire all of us to reach out to our loved ones and our communities. And we need that now more than ever. So thank you to them. All right, now I'd like to bring up our third teller for the night. Again, a little bit of a pivot. Eric Cedeno has a story about a long journey he took on his bicycle. So please welcome Eric. Ooh, unmute. All right. David, happy birthday, beautiful story. Thank you for sharing that. When I was growing up in Panama, I must have been about five, six, seven, eight years old. My mom would take me to McDonald's every single Friday. We will walk about a mile and a half, two miles. I get my happy meal and we return back. I must have been about eight years old. It was about 4.30 in the afternoon and my mom was coming home from work in the bus and she was talking to her friend and she looks outside the window and says, please stop the bus. That is my son on the sidewalk. I was about maybe four or five miles from home. My mom comes out of the bus and says, Eric, what are you doing? Where are you going? And my only response to my mom was, I just wanna see what's on the other side of McDonald's. I always tell my friends that I grew up to the perfect mom. I'm not sure if another mom would have been able to handle my spirit. I was very curious as a kid. And my mom knew that. So when I turned 12, she took me to a trip to Mexico to explore the, the Mayan and Aztec civilization, to look at pyramids and temples. That trip right there changed how I saw the world and what I wanted to do, which was to travel the world by. And my mom encouraged me that. Moving to 2012, I was riding my bike in Miami, Florida, and something that says, I wonder if I could go from Miami to Panama by bicycle. So I became obsessed with this trip and I built this bike. They measure my legs, my arms, my torso, and they build the perfect bike. It was probably an extension of who I was. It was like having an extra leg or an extra arm. And the first trip that I took this bike was from Vancouver, Canada to Tijuana, Mexico, along the Pacific Coast Highway. I fell in love with traveling by bicycle. The following year, I went from Miami to New York City. And in 2014, I did a trip that changed my life. I went from New Orleans, Louisiana up to Niagara Falls, Canada 
and I wanted to retrace the history of the Underground Railroad by bicycle. A lot of my friends and family were like, are you sure you wanna do this trip? I don't think you should. People may be mean to you, you they might be racist along the way, so it might, might not be the right trip for you to take. But I was so obsessed with this trip that I continue. I went to New Orleans, and as I was looking at my map on my second day, I could see that there was a stretch of road, about maybe 20 miles, that was going to be an empty dirt road, and I wasn't going to be able to refill my bottles of water. And I prepared myself to that. But it was so hot that day that I ran out of water right at the beginning of the dirt road. Somewhere halfway on this trip, on this dirt road, my throat started hurting. And I started using my saliva to, to ease the pain. At that moment, a vehicle, maybe like a Ford 250, passes by. And they stopped about 100 feet from me. And they started reversing. And all I could see at that moment was a shotgun in the cabin and the Confederate flag as they were re reversing. That moment, my heartbeat was pounding and I became fearful for my life. And I remember what people were telling me. As they got next to me, the passenger, the passenger says, hey, where are you coming from? And I said, I'm coming from New Orleans. Where are you heading to? I'm heading up to Canada. And she says, we saw you about 25 miles from here. We were cutting grass and we just wanted to know if you need some water. I hugged them because again, my throat was hurting. I was really thirsty and who would travel with a cooler full of water? So I hugged them and I said, you guys are angels. They had about 24 bottles and I must've drank about 22 of them and I refilled all my bottles of water. And as I blinked my eyes, they had just left. Never saw them again. At that moment, I said, and this is gonna be an interesting trip, but I know I'm protected. About three days later, got into Alabama, and I went into this small campground. And my bike was right at the entrance, and I was, as I'm ready to pay the cashier, he says, hey, whose bike is that? I say, oh, that's mine. You need me to move it? He said, no, it's fine. Where are you going? Where are you coming from? I said, I'm coming from New Orleans, heading up to Canada. I'm retracing the history of the Underground Railroad by bicycle. And his response was, I cannot profit or make money from a spiritual trip that you're in. You're going to be our guest tonight. And by the way, when you finish setting up, your tent, please come to our house. You are our guest tonight for dinner. And I just remember tears coming out of my eyes because I remember what people were telling me that people were going to be mean to me, racist. And here this man didn't know who I was, didn't want to take my money because he says, I was in a spiritual dream, a uh, spiritual trip. I continued my trip the following day and went through Tennessee, Indiana, got into Ohio. Now about 10 miles south of Ohio, I run out of water again. And I look to my right and I see a Buddhist monk watering a plant in his garden. And I asked the monk, can I have some water from your hose to fill up my bottle? He said, oh, I have some cold water inside the temple. You're welcome to come in. We walked inside and there was probably six or seven monks there. I fill up my water, cold water, and as I was heading out, one monk says, hey, where are you gonna eat tonight? So well, I have my, my campground, it's about 10 miles from here. When I get there, I'm gonna eat. He said, well, you're welcome to eat with us. And one, one lesson that I always get from traveling by bicycle is to always be in the present moment. And so about 5.30, I was losing light, sunlight, 
And one side of the brain says, no, you have to get going. You have one more hour, you have 10 more miles, you gotta get to a campground. And my other side of the brain says, but you never eaten with seven monks. So I follow that side of the brain and I decided to stay and eat uh, dinner with them. We had such a wonderful um, talk during this dinner where we were talking about life. Uh, we talked about Buddhist philosophy. And as I was doing dishes and we were putting the dishes away, one monk says, hey, you're welcome to eat, uh, sleep with us tonight if you don't have a place to stay. I said, oh, I would like to do that. And I stayed that night in the temple. And they said, well, at 5.30, you have to leave because we do uh, a chanting. So I got up around 4.30 and I was ready to leave around 5 when one monk says, now you have Buddha energy. I went on my trip and I remember getting into Pennsylvania, into Erie, and took uh, heading up to Buffalo, New York. When I got to Buffalo, New York, I was hosted by a family and they told me about more experiences and more historical sites of the Underground Railroad that I was um, be able to watch. And I looked at my camera and I saw that I didn't have enough card to take uh, uh, pictures. So I went to Walgreens and I parked my bike right by the door. And I kept looking at my bike the whole time. The only time that I looked, that I, that I took my eyes off my bike is when I went into my pocket to pay the cashier and someone screamed, someone is taking your bike really loud. When I looked outside, that person was gone. Never saw my bike again. I lost everything. Uh, gift that people gave me along the way, um, pictures, lost everything. Went back to the house of the family that hosted me and the gentleman says, well, what do you wanna do? I told them that I was paying homage to people that travel through the same route that I did and, and their journey, their freedom ended in Canada. So I wanted, I wanted to do the same. He said, well, I have a second bike it's my kid's bike, it's from 1990. It's about two sides uh, smaller than what you usually ride, but I think you could make it. Well, I rode that bike all the way up to Canada, about 15 miles. Um, and when I get to Canada, I immediately went, flew home to Miami. And I remember one night thinking about my trip and a voice that I heard, which now I call it my inner teacher, says, if you don't forget about that bike, you can never remember the beautiful experience, how compassionate people were, how loving people were, how kind people were on this trip. You are only focusing on one day. So I had to let it go. My mom passed away in 1993 but I hear her in every single adventure that I take. And she looks down and says, Eric, where are you doing? Where are you going? I look up and I tell my mom, I just wanna see what's on the other side of McDonald's. Thank you guys. Eric, what a way to bring it back to the start. I love that. I, I so enjoy that your story is about discovery and serendipity because I know in this time that's something I'm really missing is exploration and being out in the world and having fun. So to get to experience even a little bit of that through your story was such a joy. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, as viewers, as I'm sure all of you can tell, all of these stories are complex journeys that took a lot of work for our tellers to craft into a short story for you to listen to tonight. And that's thanks in part to the coaching that they worked with. Um, excuse me, sorry, I lost my place for a second there. We have coaches who are journalists from across the USA Today network who work with these tellers. Each teller works for a few hours each, at least, with these coaches who are all journalists. And so I want to thank the journalists at the Des Moines Register, the Arizona Republic, and the Ventura County Star who worked with our tellers tonight. And thank you to the tellers for putting in so much work and time to be part of this show.
If as viewers, you would like to support the journalists who make these shows possible, you can do that by subscribing to one of those papers or to one of the more than 260 papers that the USA Today Network has across the country. They're going to drop a little link in the chat where you can click to get more information on how to get a subscription. They're pretty cheap. I hope you check it out. All right, now I would like to bring up our second to last teller for the night. It's actually two tellers. It's Barry and Constance Karcher, and they have a story about Barry being in the Arctic as part of a History Channel TV show. Welcome to Barry and Constance. Hi, Hi everybody. thank you. Thanks for being here. Yeah. So I awoke one frigid morning, September 9th in 2018. I was around the Great Slave Lake in the far Northwest territories of Canada. I was about 300 miles south of the Arctic Circle, and myself and nine other participants that day were preparing to be launched via helicopter to begin self-filming for the hit survival TV show alone on the History Channel. But amongst all that hustle and bustle, where I was really at was the fact that I was over 2,000 miles north of my wife, our two-year-old son, and our two-month-old daughter. My September 9th was a little bit different. Um, I obviously, our daughter was not sleeping through the night yet. I had spoken to him the night before for what I thought was the last time. I was exhausted, gotten up to make our son breakfast and the phone rings. So I answer it and it's, it's him and he's talking very quietly and very hurried. And I know that he's snuck off to, to call me one last time um, before he gets dropped off. We exchange I love you's and I give them some words of encouragement. And that was it. That was our last phone call for an indeterminate amount of time. And it went very quick. <laughs> <laughs> a little backstory for those of you who may not be aware about what Alone is about. Um, essentially, it's a, it's a, it's a self-film survival show where 10 participants are provided 10 different types of survival items that they're choosing and then are placed in a very remote and often very inhospitable location and left to survive with those 10 items. Um, the reason for me being so excited about the process was that with a young family, the last person standing wins a half a million dollars and I was very motivated. <laughs> but I remember it was a spring morning and we had just put our son down for his nap. My wife was still pregnant with our daughter. And we decided to just relax, kick it, watch some television. And uh, we took our appropriate sides of the of the living room and she began working on her sudoku and i turned on the history channel and began watching alone and as i was watching the show i i felt like this dynamic like overwhelming pull to apply so i remember digging my phone out of my pocket and 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 begin thumbing away and working at the application out of the corner of my eye i still remember to this day my wife puts down her sudoku and she goes what are you doing <laughs> And I said, oh, I'm applying for the show. And I remember her looking at me and, go, and going, if you're applying for this show alone, then I'm gonna go ahead and start making preparations because I know you're gonna make it on the show. And that is probably the largest testament, if, if I could give you any, to the kind of support I've had from my wife throughout our entire marriage. Um, I remember it was incredible we actually heard back. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to have a phone conversation and I had that phone conversation and there was like a several month vetting process. And I remember being invited to go to New York to something called boot camp. Boot camp is where they had deduced the nearly 22,000 applicants down to the final 24 uh, participants who were going to competing for the, the bots on the show. And I was, I was pretty freaking stoked. I remember this. <laughs> Whenever you got there, there was there were several layers to the process. First, they would uh, make sure you were physically able to withstand the pressures that were going to be coming from from being out there on the show up to an entire year. Uh, they checked your psychological evaluations, and of course, we had camera classes. We had to make sure that we could self film it all because we had to do everything while we were out there. And then finally, my bushcraft skills were put to the test, and I remember just pouring my heart out at this thing. I mean, I gave it every single thing I had. It was July 3rd, and I was standing in the bolt aisle at the local Home Depot, and uh, I remember feeling my phone vibrate in my pocket. And whenever I pulled it out, the caller ID said New York. 
And I felt this chill go up my heels, up my spine, up my back and my neck, because I knew that this was the call that we had been waiting for. So I answered the call and uh, sure enough, it was the History Channel cordially inviting me to be a participant in season six of Alone. And I was thrilled. <clears throat> that trip to Home Depot, I will never forget. <laughs> we were there. Our daughter was just a few days away from her scheduled delivery. We were there, I think, getting a bolt he wanted to replace in the crib. Boring, you know. So I wandered her <laughs> off to look at carpet samples. And when I come back, he's just standing there on the phone, eyes wide, arms up in the air. <laughs> and my heart kind of sinks and flutters at the same time because I know exactly what that call means. Like He's in. So we had our little celebration in the aisle of Home Depot. Uh, a few days later, we welcomed our little baby girl and eight very, very short weeks after that, dad ships off to the greatest adventure of his life. And it's really hard for me when I think back to quantify the emotions I had in those first few days, because I think I probably ran through them all at some point. Um, but the thing I tried to keep at the forefront of my mind was that he was going out there to lay it all on the line and it was my job to hold it down at home. And so I, you know, I knew that, that I had no choice. Our daughter was fiery, our little baby girl. And so, you know, added an extra layer of challenge, but we totally found our groove. You know, we got into a routine and it got, you know, relatively easy. Um, but the thing that kind of kept me on my toes was the worry and I, worry might not even be the right word. I was just consumed with thinking about him. You know, what is the shelter like? Um, what has he encountered any wild animals? What's he learning? Is he happy? You know, all of these millions of questions and I had zero answers, no communication whatsoever from him. Every two weeks or so though, I got an email from my contact in production mm -hmm. and they just told me he was still in the competition. That's it. <laughs> no more, no less. No matter how hard I tried, believe me, I really, really tried. I approve. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, okay, go to cut to launch day. I remember I was standing in, on this very remote gravel runway and I could feel the stones under my feet. I mean, this was the only way in and only way out around this uh, very large lake located in the far Northwest territories. And as I was taking in lungfuls of that Arctic air, trying to prepare myself for what was about to happen, I decided just to kind of skirt away to the side and sit on my rock, which was filled with these items that I was most definitely, you know, hoping to help me bring home this moolah. <laughs> but as I was sitting there, I, I, I began to feel like an imposter. That's, that's truth. I remember, I remember looking at Jordan Jonas. I mean, this guy lived in Siberia for four years and like rode caribou around to hunt other caribou. Uh, <laughs> Wonia, I mean, I was watching Wonia and she was wearing the clothes from the animals that she had caught and skinned. I mean, she was, she had made her clothes for this event. I mean, I, I'm just a normal Kentucky boy. I, I've spent time in the woods. <laughs> you know, I, I shop at Kohl's like probably the rest of you. I was... I completely felt out of my league, but then I remember being completely centered by one very easy thought that just kind of came over me and it was my why. I remembered who was home holding it down. I remember who was home who had my back. I remember who was home doing all of the things that I was supposed to be doing. And I found my strength. And when it was my turn after watching these other individuals get lifted off to locations that we had never seen before, I remember scooping up my rucksack, grabbing my recurve bow and just literally going, here goes nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Getting into the uh, helicopter, I remember slipping on the, the earphones and I had a cameraman to my right and he had the camera in my face and he was asking me certain questions. How are you feeling? Uh, what, what are you experiencing? <laughs> and I remember looking out the window and from the canopy above, it looked a lot like home. I began to kind of feel comfortable. I was, as I was looking down on the canopy, I go, this looks a lot like Colorado. And then I got dropped off. <laughs> and to be perfectly honest, I might as well have been on Mars. This was nothing like Colorado. <laughs> and I remember for the first five to six days, I was scared. I, I, I felt like I was just treading water. I was so grateful that my needs were so simple. 
right? Shelter, fire, water, and food. Because what was really churning in my mind and something that was really combating was the fact that my wife and family and I, we still had the same time zone. Even though I was 2,000 miles north, my five o'clock when I was building my first hasty shelter that day, my wife was preparing a meal and feeding our children. At six o'clock, when I was making a small fire to warm myself, my wife was preparing a bath and getting our children clean from the day. At seven, whenever I slid into my negative 40 degree bag for my first long night in the Arctic, I knew my wife was putting our children to bed and she was beginning her first very long night in, <laughs> yeah. in, in your experience. We survived, so here we are. We made it. Um, I still have zero clue how he did it. Um, I had tons of family and friends that came in to keep me sane, help out around the house, and could not have done it without them. Absolutely. Um, I had food it. and a comfortable bed and <laughs> other things to keep me to know to get me by. But the thing that helped me really, I knew that this dude was going out there and he was going to give it everything. And and it's not only, oh, he's going to go out there and try really hard. Like I, we had discussed giving up. We had discussed that that was not an option just for missing his family. Um, and I've seen this guy do things that he puts his mind to. Okay. Outlandish, crazy things. I've seen it over and over again. And so I knew that it's, he was out there in those moments, I guess, that I could come up for air from missing him so much. I was just so proud and so excited for this experience for him. And I knew that no matter what happened, I am married to a hero. And she's an Valkyrie. Like, <laughs> I, I would have tapped out on day three if, if the roles had been reversed. But one of the things that I think a lot of people don't see on the show is that, you know, our survival as a couple, it didn't end just because I, I came home. Um, I survived 69 days in the wild um, and it was everything I hoped it would be. Um, unfortunately, I did experience a, a deep state of starvation. I ended up losing over 33% of my body weight, uh, 82 pounds to be exact. Um, I was pulled from the show for medical reasons, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful that they did that. They have always had our best interests as well as my health. History Channel um, has always taken very good care of its participants and us. But I think the biggest thing that I took away from the entire experience, and there were a lot of takeaways, but the one thing that has stayed with me is that when I came back, I was a shell of a man that I was. I wasn't the protector, the provider, nor was I the producer that I had been used to, but my wife never left my side. When I came back with the eating problem, because you can't just go through something like that and come back home and begin eating anything. Um, whenever I couldn't sleep in the bed for two weeks or whenever I just needed a good hug, you know, she was always there and has continued to be so. So my point with all that is that if you have somebody the way I do, who's willing to stick with you through your most challenging evolutions, then you truly have everything you need. You have everything. Thank you, thank you guys. guys. Oh my gosh. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. I feel like I could listen to 45 minutes of that story, but I understand we can't do that tonight. Um, but what an incredible story of partnership. It just reminds me, I should be softer on my husband for not doing enough dishes during quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> or don't. It's okay. It's We're, a good reminder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you both again. Thank, thank you. you very much. All right. And now I would like to bring up our last teller for the night, Megan Finnerty, who has a story about how nature can be a place for self-reflection. Welcome, me. Megan. Ooh. Hi. <laughs> um. Thanks, Kayla. I'm excited. So, yeah, normally I'm your MC and I'm the host of Storytellers, but tonight I'm just here to tell a story. Uh, so I'll get into it. So when I was really little, I don't, I don't know exactly how old I was, like maybe five or six, um, but I remember waking up in the middle of the night and going out to talk to my mom and crying uncontrollably because space was infinite. 
Um, I'd obviously learned that at school, like it was a good science class and I had taken into heart uh, that, you know, the galaxy keeps growing and that there is no limit on how big space is. And for some reason, this was terrifying to me as a small child. And I don't think that's that surprising, right? Like I grew up in a really small town and when you're really little, your front yard and your driveway are like the limits of your universe, right? And then maybe past that, like Lake Michigan was like two blocks away. And so I knew about the lake. But like other than that, your world as a very small child is like really measurable. It's very manageable. It's all right here. And for some reason, I was just incredibly frightened at the idea of infinite space. It was too much for me. And I felt like we were just floating around in the universe and that I could like fly off the planet and how would we stay safe and like what was going on? And like, it was just too much for my little baby brain. And my mom was a scientist, uh, like she, not a scientist, my mom was a park ranger, but so she had like a science background. Like she studied biology and um, the natural environment. So she didn't like try to scam me. She was like, yeah, space is infinite. But like, also don't worry about it. Uh, that was really it. You know, she snuggled me and I'm sure I fell asleep on her and she put me back into bed. But she didn't have some like magical thing to say. She just sort of like, yeah, you're correct. That's true, but it's nothing to be afraid of because like it's the natural order of things. And I'm sure she like explained about the stars and planets and stuff like that. But it was also probably very late at night and it was time for bed. And so that's about as much as I'd have really given thought to the stars because I grew up outside of uh, Chicago in a small town called Long Beach or Michigan City. And you can't see the stars really too much where I'm from. Like there's just a lot of light pollution. And so I didn't grow up like thinking about the galaxy or the Milky Way and its arms or the constellations. Like I learned about them, but it seemed like something other people could see, not really something like I could get close to until my family took a really a really like important transformative vacation to the west when I was 15 years old. My twin sister and I were 15, my brother would have been 11 and our little sister Carolyn would have been uh okay, uh 8 and um we went to the Rocky Mountains, Grand Canyon and Arches National Parks and Canyonlands. So it was a two week vacation for a family of six in a Dodge Grand Caravan. It was intense, but we started at the Rocky Mountains. And on our first night, we all like climbed into our sleeping bags. It was very dark and very cold. And we started to go to bed. But then my mom, um, probably like a few minutes after we all like got snuggled in, she was probably wrapping up something at a campsite. She was like, kids, get out of bed. And so we got out of bed and she was so cold. Uh, it's very cold, even in the middle of the summer in Rocky Mountain National Park. And um, she points up and she says, look. And for the first time in my life, I saw the arms of the galaxies and I was like, oh my God, like the Milky Way has like curving arms. You can see them in the darkness. I didn't know that. I just thought you could see it in pictures of the galaxy. And suddenly I felt so small and it was so beautiful. And my mom was like so pleased to be sharing this like incredible view that obviously like, listen, if you live in the West um, and you live like in wild and dark spaces and certainly if you live in the mountains, you can see the arms of the Milky Way. But if you don't, it feels miraculous. And she was showing it to us and it was amazing. But it was also really, really cold. And so we like got back in our sleeping bags and moved on, you know, like had the rest, had the rest of the night. And i would always remembered that as like this really magical moment. Um, but obviously I moved back to Northwest Indiana and then I went to Purdue in central Indiana and I didn't see the night sky. It wasn't like a powerful part of my life because it's just like, well, it's not, it's not very easy to see. There's a lot of light pollution in the Midwest. But then when I was 22, I moved to Phoenix. And Phoenix is a big, huge city with a lot of light pollution, but it is in the West and there's not a ton around it. Like once you get out of the city, it gets really dark. And I knew that you could see the stars in like a really magical way outside the city. And I would like drive out into the desert sometimes and kind of like look up and be like, wow, this is like such a beautiful place. You know, it's like very, very magical out here. But I didn't have like a big, I didn't have like a personal relationship with the stars until one weekend I went up to the Grand Canyon's dark sky party. It's always in the new moon in June. And it's a real thing. Thousands and thousands of people get together on the rim of the Grand Canyon to go up and look at the stars. And it's really fun and interesting and weird and nerdy and 
people who have expensive telescopes literally just let strangers walk up to them in the dark and peer through a little eye scope and look up. And I was really curious about this because I've become passionate about the idea that like humans can, we can do something about light pollution. Essentially, like you can just not light your house at night and you can talk about how to, you know, you can like try to get policies written that make your signage darker. And like light pollution is a thing you personally can do something about. And it like also saves you money and makes you healthier. And like, you know, it's good for the birds. And I started to learn more and more about it because I'd learned that Phoenix's light pollution goes all the way to the south rim of the Grand Canyon. I wrote a bunch of stories about it as a journalist, and I just got like very into this idea that Phoenix is very far from the Grand Canyon. Like it's about a five hour drive, four and a half. And um, that seems like an incredible distance from our like city's light cast to glow. And I wanted to figure out more about it. So I studied it, I went up to the park. The park is now a dark skies park, it's very cool. And I had this really incredible experience. There was a park ranger named Marker Marshall and uh, she gave us a dark skies tour, which is really just walking around in the dark of a parking lot with a tiny little green laser pointer. She's in her full fancy uniform and everyone else is just in like sweatshirts. And it's probably 10 o'clock at night, so it's real dark. And Marco was walking around showing us the constellations in the middle of the night and, or in the middle of this event. And she's pointing out, you know, all these different stories about the constellations and how they got their names and you know who named them and why they're important in mythology and all this stuff and then she said something i'd never heard before because like i'm the least outdoorsy member of my family so i didn't like know a lot about dark skies and orienteering and you know how to get around without a map but she said something that maybe if you're a naturalist or you're a, uh, um, certainly if you are a nautical adventurer you might know these things but she said if you can figure out, like you use your hand, you kind of like figure out how far from the horizon the any individual um, constellation is that you're looking at. And then you figure out like uh, what, like you identify it, you know which one it is. And she pointed out that if you can name the constellations and you can figure out about how, how far over the horizon it is, you can know when in the night it is, when in the seasons, like what time of year it is where you are, where on the earth you are, and beyond that, like kind of where you are in the solar system, right? You're on the planet Earth. And I know that might sound really obvious to some of you, but like I didn't know how to read the constellations to orient myself on the planet and in time. And she explained in this really chill way that the constellations are maps for all of us. Like they can tell us where we are according to all these metrics, and, or not metrics, but like in space and time. And she said very coolly, very smoothly, well, you know, you're a creature born in a planet in an ecosystem, and that ecosystem, like, you belong here, and you can orient yourself through the stars. And it wasn't a religious idea that she was communicating to us. It was like a navigation idea she was communicating to us. She was just telling me something a lot of people know that had, like, escaped me as a middle-class girl from Indiana who, like, doesn't do outdoor adventuring without maps. And so that really struck with, stuck with me. And I thought about how, like, I wish that little little kid version of myself could have known that. That, like, there is something really profound that when you look out at the night sky, you can remind yourself that you were born in an ecosystem on a planet in the solar system and that you belong there. Like, your body is an animal that lives here. Like, you're safe and there's food and there's water and hopefully you live in a temperate environment or you have access to a temperate environment. And that's a really profound thought because a lot of the times, like, I'm one of those people that gets in my head and I can feel sort of like anxious or alienated or lonely and, you know, you feel like what's happening right now. And instead, you realize, like, no, I belong here. And if I look up at the night sky, I can know exactly when and where I am. That is so profound. So I often wish that like my little kid self knew that. And maybe it would have been like a lot for, I don't know, a first grader to digest. But I think I would have understood the idea. And that would have meant a lot to me. So thanks for listening to this story. Or, you know, I'm totally telling it in honor of my mom, who is a park ranger, and then raised two daughters who are park rangers, and raised me just to be an outdoor lover. And my dad, who is a Boy Scout master, and my brother, who's an Eagle Scout. So when I say I am the least outdoorsy member of my family, I literally mean I am the only one that can't chop wood. Thanks, guys. Thanks for watching. <laughs>
Megan, thank you so much for that story. It makes me so excited for a future in which we can go back to the Grand Canyon. Amen. I know. But also for those who don't know, Megan is the founder and director of the Storytellers Project. So I want to say thank you to you on behalf of all of our viewers for making these virtual shows possible so all hundreds or thousands of us can be connected and having fun tonight. So thank you, Megan. Um, thanks for watching. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. So let's bring up all the tellers for one final goodbye, a take a bow situation. Imagine, woo, wave, the crowd is going Bye, to everyone. Hire. You did so well. This was so fun. Yeah. Everyone wants to talk yeah. to you at the bar. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for watching. Uh, I forgot to thank them down. earlier. I want to thank the Fort Collins, Coloradoan and the Nashville, Tennessean for the coaching they did for this show as well. Viewers, please let us know what you thought about the show and leave us a comment on whatever platform you're watching this on. Uh, let us know what you took away from it. Give us any feedback. Everything helps us know what you thought and how we can do better next time. If you love these stories and you want to know more from the Storytellers Project, you can follow the Storytellers Project on Facebook, on YouTube, on Instagram, or if you'd like to hear more stories, you can find the Air, or sorry, the Storytellers Project podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And with that, thank you for watching. I hope you have a lovely rest of your evening. Good night. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this video, check out these other videos from USA Today to stay up to date with all the latest news.